with me are uh, my friends Urvi, Suti, and Rohit. Of course, and Rohit is presenting today. Uh, through Launchpad, we usually have talks every month. We didn't, of course, because due to these this whole COVID thing for the past couple of months. But we usually have talks in person. Uh, we took this opportunity now to start online so that um, people can join no matter where they are. Otherwise, we were in Pune, specifically in Kothrud. Uh, but now, no matter where you are, you can join us. It's free. Uh, we specifically want more school students to join. This is uh, primarily targeted at school students. We'll talk more about this later. Uh, but yeah, I'm really glad that all of you are here today. And I'll just hand it over to Rohit. I think most of you have seen the ads, so you kind of know um, about us, you know about Rohit. But Rohit can very briefly introduce himself again, just to kind of put us all on the same page. Yeah, Rohit. So welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, Taxi Ride Through Computer Science. I'm Rohit Aute. I'm a computers engineer. Uh, well, almost a computer engineer. My final year exams are not yet done, unfortunately. Uh, you probably heard that in the video, in the promo video as well. And uh, I'm also a Microsoft student partner. So this is like a, a community outreach program by Microsoft. And I'm expected to like share my knowledge and you know uh, talk about technology with people, uh, with the community, in uh, you know, in my community, basically. So this is the first ever event that I'm doing, and I'm really, really excited for this. Uh, so shall we get started? I think we should get started. I'm not going to hear much from you, I guess, most of you. OK, so before we begin, I want to set up some ground rules, OK? I want everyone's mics to be turned off, because, it's, because it can get really chaotic if you, know, you just hear someone's background noise or something. So the first thing I'm going to do is mute you all, and I would really appreciate if you could keep uh, your microphones on mute. I would really appreciate that you start off your camera. I would love to see your faces. I would love to see your reactions. Uh, that would really make this, uh, you know, feel as lifelike as possible. You know, since we were unable to do this in person. Uh, since you're all uh, on mute and I can't really see you, uh, here's the thing. I keep asking questions like, you know. Do you understand or throughout the session i will be asking questions like do you understand do you follow or you know does it make sense so i would love if you guys could like respond with something like this like yes or no is that fine is it cool people again raise their hands yeah okay yeah oh yeah and yeah. you can even use the yeah. raise hand option if you like that would be amazing okay so yeah that's one thing and uh yeah, I think someone asked in the chat that uh, whether you know you'll be able to interrupt me and you know ask questions. Uh, we would really love that, but since this is an online format, that could get really chaotic. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to stop after a few slides, every few slides, and we'll take uh, a few questions, like a couple of questions, and at the very end we'll also have a Q and A session. So hold on to your questions. If uh, I'm unable to answer them during, you know, in between the slides, I'll definitely try and answer them. Uh, in the question and answer section. Uh, and finally, even if we run out of time for Q&A, uh, I'll be sharing my contact details so you can reach out to me after the session. I would love, I would absolutely love uh, to help you out and we can have a conversation about uh, about this. So cool. Yeah, OK, I guess. Awesome. Yeah, I'm seeing some hands raised. That, that, that's good, I guess. So. Let's get started. Let's start this uh, this little journey. So the agenda for today is that I want to show you, you know, I want to give you an introduction to computer science and tell you what it's all about. Uh, I'm not going to waste too much time on these slides. So yeah, I'm going to talk about computer science. I'm going to talk about all of the subfields uh, in computer science, and we're going to take and we're going to do this by taking the example of popular apps like Uber and Ola. So these are uh, these apps are a good example of, uh, you know, computer science. Pretty much every field of computer science working to make something possible. So when you take a taxi ride, behind the scenes, almost every major branch, sub branch of computer science is at work. So this is a good opportunity to you know look at the landscape of computer science, to look at everything it has to offer. So we're going to do that, and at the very end, we'll of course have a Q and A session. Now the motivation, uh, I don't know how many of you saw the promo video, but our major motivation here at Launchpad is that 
you know, computer science is a highly neglected field in Indian schools. It's not taught at all. As far as I can remember, I was only taught uh, HTML and like 30 minutes of QBasic and that's about it. Uh, I would have really, uh, I think I would be in a very different position if I had learned computer science back in school. And our country produces so many uh, computer engineers every year. Our IT industry is huge. So it's isn't it kind of sad that, you know, computer science is still not a big deal in schools? So that's that's kind of what we are trying to change here. We want people to know about computer science. We want people to know uh, what it's about before they take it up as their engineering course. And we want them to know that it's, it's not just programming or... Um, you know, just a means to get a job or just, to, you know, just building apps. It's far, far more than that. It's a very beautiful field and we want to develop curiosity about it in, in young minds. So that's it for the motivation. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's begin a ride. Okay, keep doing this. Cool, ready? Ready to hop on? Kaya, two people, two people are raising their hands. Come on, four, five. Yeah, yeah we're ready. Good. Let's begin our ride. Very good, very good. Amazing. So, uh, okay, I'm going to have to mute you all again. Thank you, but whoever spoke, thank you for that. So, uh, you want to take a taxi ride. What is the first thing you do? You whip out your phone and you open the Uber or Ola app. So, let's start from the app. Uh, this is probably one of the most popular fields of computer science. It's software development, you know, making apps and making websites and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So this is what a lot of people, you know, think of computer science as, you know, just building software. And that's really not true. And you'll see how in this session. But let's start off with that. This is how you interact with Uber. You open up the app, you type in, uh, you know, your location, your destination, you select the type of cab you want and then you press that ride now button and uber and, and a taxi so shows up at your doorstep it's pretty amazing so let's talk about what software development what all you know comes under software development you're obviously building you know an application that people are going to be using so it's very important that the user interface is good you know look at this this is a pretty this is a pretty application right it's, it looks really good it's slick it's modern so that's uh, part of software development, user interfaces, and UX means uh, user experience. So, you know, is the app intuitive to use? Is it immediately obvious what needs to be done in order to, you know, accomplish a task in this app? So this is a quite a deep study on its own, and it's really interesting. And by the way, if you're just starting out with programming, this is actually really good, you know, not just programming, but computer science in general, this is a great way to get into computer science because, you know, actually write, like writing some code and seeing it visually is, is really, really satisfying. The second thing that software development uh, comes with is, well, you just, you made that beautiful layout, you know, it's all animated and it looks slick, but you also need stuff to happen when you, you know, interact with the UI, when you start press a button, for example, when you press that right now button in Uber or Ola, the taxi should actually come to your place. So that's what happens with, uh, so, you know, all of that is the business logic of your app. This is the actual, um, you know, stuff that happens behind the scenes in order to, you know, accomplish uh, the task. Like, for example, when you click on that right now button, Uber has to talk to uh, its servers. It's, you know, finding a taxi for you. It's uh, calculating your ETA or, you um, or what else does it do? It calculates, uh, it, it finds the best distance between your location and your destination. All of that needs to be done behind the scenes and that all, and all of that comes under business logic. And uh, if you're developing software, it need, uh, you know, people don't use just the same uh, phones. So people use Android, iOS, uh, maybe you're building a website. So you're dealing with multiple platforms. So maybe you want to develop, maybe you want to be an Android developer or an iOS developer or a, or a web developer or you know a combination of those, uh, or maybe you want to develop for you know desktop, Windows, Mac, stuff like that. So software development is huge. This is one of the biggest industries uh, as far as uh, you know, like the subfields of computer science goes. This is one of the most. Uh, this is one of those fields which has a lot of jobs, and. Uh, it's fun. If you want to start off, this is really, really fun. So let's move on. You click on that right uh, now. Rohit, uh, just, uh -huh. just a sec. I think uh, people are having issues with their mic. There are a lot of people who are saying so in the chat. Could you just give us a minute so we can figure out what's going on? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, 
okay a lot of people are like um, continuously like leaving and joining the meeting are you people having issues with your mic could you unmute yourself and tell us what the problem is can, can you not see can you not hear what's uh, what's wrong would would you people like to unmute yourselves and just tell us you can just type in the chat okay thanks amol cool is anyone having issues yeah i think uh, someone uh, i think pritam was having issues uh, he left uh, i asked him to rejoin and uh, i think some other a uh, couple of other people are continuously um, leaving and rejoining the meeting oh yeah riya left and joined again actually many are unable to see the screen asmita says wow okay so i for the majority of the people they're able to hear and see so for those of you who are not able to i think it's a connection issue uh, you might want to rejoin from a different device or try to connect to a stronger wifi if possible yeah i mean most people are not having any issue so i think we'll have to continue and, and also we're recording this meeting so we're going to put this up uh on social media you can see any part you missed yeah 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 this is all going to be online right okay i think we can go on then okay 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 so you press that uh, you add or you added all of the details like your location your uh, your de- the destination that you would like to travel to and you know now we've hit that right now button now as you all know uber needs uh, you know uber and ola these apps need uh, internet connectivity so uh, why did they need that because the stuff that that i talked about you know all of the business logic uh, that i mentioned you know finding taxis and planning the best route for you all of that stuff happens on uber's servers okay these are like computers owned by uber and uh, all of this uh, processing is done there so uh, your app actually needs to talk to these servers and well how do you do that you do that using the internet and you use computer networks for that so this is another really really vast and interesting field of uh, computer science this is um, you know i'll geek about it after that afterwards but basically uh, most apps need to talk to servers it's not just uber and ola even if you're like talking on whatsapp your messages are going to the whatsapp servers and then they're going to their destination so you always need servers you always need networking and let's talk about some let's talk about you know how networking works in general so uh, your phone is generating some data you know maybe this request that you placed with uber for a taxi this request uh, your phone will generate this request and it will send it over the internet it will travel through you know multiple networks it will go through your isp so maybe uh, the isp is your internet service provider so maybe you know i'm using bsnl here so my data is going to go through their servers and then it will eventually reach uber servers after that so that's typically how and that's why it's called you know internet it's traveling across networks in order to reach its final destination and in order to make this happen uh, there are a few things that networks do so right now uh, so let's talk about the first point here you know let's jump into the presentation networking involves study and design of standard protocols so let me just explain this this is because when you start learning about computer networks this is going to be you're going to be you know bombarded with protocols there's there are a lot of protocols so a protocol is just a, a formal way of communication like right now i'm speaking to you in english this session is in english you're able to understand what i'm saying because you understand english i understand english and that's the reason this communication is well possible if i was speaking in a foreign language uh this won't make sense to you if i was speaking in uh, i don't know japanese very few people would be able to understand so uh, this logic applies here as well your phone and the server should have uh, you know they should know the protocol they should use the same protocol they should understand the same protocol and for this reason we have standard protocols these are openly available they are agreed upon by a huge number of people and companies big companies and uh, then they are you know they are part of every computer pretty much every computer out there and so does that make sense you can uh, okay does it you can use the okay good good so yeah that's one thing so you need standard protocols so some of the protocols are tcp ip http 
uh udp these are some of the very popular protocols that are used for communication next thing uh uh, I talked about how the app is sending a, a ride request to the Uber servers. Well, that entire piece of information won't go you know, as a whole. What networks typically do is that they break stuff down into packets. You may have heard of this word, uh, internet packets. Uh, and each of these packets may travel over a different route over the, uh, over the network. And it's the responsibility of the network to like find the best possible route. Uh, it's really interesting and you will be, if you take up computer science, you will be learning about how these things actually work, how data is broken down into packets, how these protocols work, how a network finds the best possible route and it, it's pretty amazing. And uh, if you're communicating, you also need to ensure that, you know, whatever you're sending, uh, for in this case, uh, the app is sending stuff to the Uber servers, you need to be confident that the stuff is actually reaching the servers. You need some sort of guarantees about that. And uh, even that, uh, we have protocols for even that. So networking is amazing. I, we take it for granted every day. Uh, the, we use the internet, um, you know, like it's a natural resource, but it's pretty amazing. It, it's a really, really complex uh, thing. And the fact that it even works as well as it does, it, it's pretty amazing. So. Yeah, let's let's move on from networks now. So the app has now sent uh, your ride request to the servers, but um, well, you want your communication between, uh, I mean, the communication between the app and the server to be private, right? You don't want anyone snooping in on on this communication. Like why? Like what if someone, uh, I don't know, like you add your destination, and someone is able to read that destination because your data when it's going over the internet. Anyone can read it. So you don't want that to happen. You want privacy. You don't want anyone snooping in on your internet activity. And this is where cybersecurity comes in. So uh, one of the major ideas in cybersecurity is that, uh, you know, everything, all of the data that basically goes over the internet should be anonymous. Uh, and even if someone comes across that data, eh, they, they, they shouldn't be able to do anything with it. And for that, we use something called encryption. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, let's say, uh, let's say I am uh, placing an Uber request for, and I want to go to Deccan. For all of you who are outside of Pune, who are joining us from outside Pune, Deccan is a place in Pune. Uh, it's a pretty popular place. So let's say my destination is Deccan. That's what I've typed into Uber. Now, if I just send Deccan over the internet and someone, maybe BSNL or maybe some attacker or a hacker or something, like a malicious uh, you know, person, is able to retrieve that, that's kind of dangerous, right? We don't want that. Uh, I only want the my destination to be known between me and Uber. I don't want anyone else snooping in. So instead of sending Deccan as it is over the internet, what the app or what my phone would do is it will encrypt it. It So what it will do is it will take this this Deccan word and it will, complete, uh, it will convert it into this complete gibberish here. And you see this, this makes no sense, right? It just seems like a random sequence of characters. And now the app will send this over the internet. So even if someone were to get access to this, even if someone reads this, they won't be able to make any sense out of it, right? How the hell is anyone supposed to know that this means Deccan? So this is what actually travels over the internet. And it when it reaches the destination, our destination in this case is, uh, you know, the Uber servers. When this gibberish reaches the servers, it will be decrypted. So uh, the Uber servers will again be able to read the original message, whatever it was. And this is kind of amazing, right? What do you think? This is pretty amazing. This is some really intense mathematics. And uh, it's, it's really interesting. This is called cryptography. This is uh, partly computer science, partly mathematics. And it deals with, you know, how you can do this con these conversions. There are many, many ways of doing this, but this is the basic idea. This is basically how all of your online transactions and all your online communications, even, even this uh, video call that we're having right now is secure. And uh, this is this is the basic idea. So we've sent uh, a request to the Uber server, to Uber servers, and it's secure. So let's move on to the next bit. Uh, yeah. I've been talking about servers, 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 okay? I've been throwing this word around. But uh, most companies these days do not want to, you know, manage their own servers. A server is 
basically a physical it, it's just a computer okay it's a different kind of a computer but it's still a computer and uh, if you're operating at a scale as as huge as uber and ola or you know or any big application you need lots and lots and lots of servers you need warehouses full of servers and they're called data centers but the thing is that uh, you know it's very expensive and very tedious and it's very difficult to maintain these data centers because you constantly have servers crashing you need to keep all of those servers cool you need to keep them updated you need to keep the software updated it's it's a pain in the butt so uh, wouldn't it be great if someone else kind of managed all of that for you and you could just use the servers as it is and without having to worry about you know building all of them from scratch so this is exactly the idea with cloud computing cloud computing is basically uh using or rather renting someone else's server and using it as your own for a while you know it could be uh, for a while could mean 5 minutes an hour a year forever whatever so there are uh, cloud platform there are cloud providers or you know cloud computing platforms like microsoft's azure is uh, is a very popular cloud computing platform and what they do is so what microsoft has done with azure is that they build these massive huge huge data centers all over the world and uh, uh, they build these and they stuff them up with lots and lots and lots of servers and whenever companies like uber or ola or even me even if i need a server i can just go on microsoft azure's website and i can say hey i want this server i want this kind of a server can just give it to me and they'll provision the server for me and i can start using it right away and maybe you know uh, i'm building like a, i'm a startup my um you know my so my startup is really small right now but it gets really popular really popular i can just ask microsoft to give me more servers it's very easy for me i don't need to worry about you know uh, maintaining that data center and managing all of those servers microsoft will do all of that for me i can just conveniently sit here go on microsoft's website and just keep adding more servers so it's cheap because you know you don't have to maintain a data center again uh it's scalable as i said if you need more servers you can just you know literally go on the website and provision more servers and you'll have them in a few minutes it's extremely convenient i think uh that that's quite evident by now and it's extremely easy to use so ola uses microsoft azure it's uh, ola runs on microsoft's azure platform and uber runs on something called aws which stands for amazon web services it's amazon's uh, web uh, you know cloud computing platform so these are some of the big names even uber uses um, azure for some of their tasks uh, a fun example is uh, again netflix i think everyone uses netflix uh, netflix runs entirely on amazon web services i think that that's that's kind of cool so yeah what what's the ratio on this are people following this let me see the numbers cool does anyone have any doubts at the moment what about google uh w- what exactly do you mean means uh, does google uh, does google have its own cloud computing or uh, okay, it also runs on Yeah, yeah. Google has its own infrastructure. In fact, Google has some of the most advanced infrastructure out there, and uh, even they have their own cloud platform called Google Cloud Platform. So, uh, AWS, Azure, and GCP—that's Google Cloud Platform—are some of the big names in the cloud computing industry. Oh. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, what do you do when all of the server space runs out? Uh. okay they basically <laughs> that that's a pretty good question even i th- thought of that but you know that usually doesn't happen uh, these companies they have massive massive warehouses and it's very unlikely that you'll ever run out of server space they are always uh, they always have more servers than the demand so that they can you know give give out servers but don't you think it's going to be kind of an unsustainable model for the next 50 years Oh uh, no it's actually a pretty good model because now everyone doesn't have to have their own data centers they can just have they can just use a cloud computing uh, provider it it makes the job easier you know instead of having everyone do the same job only a few companies can do this you know rather tedious job and others can just enjoy it. <laughs> others can reap the benefits of that okay anyone else okay someone on the chat is asking is encryption the same for particular location all the time oh no 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 
uh okay vedang what i what i talked about was a massive oversimplification of what encryption is it's it's a lot more complicated than that and uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of the session but if you're interested just uh, i'll give you my contact details and we can have a conversation about this offline cool okay so shall i move on okay i'm moving on so that's cloud computing this is again one of the hottest topics out there uh, this is a huge industry and a lot of businesses these days are moving to the cloud so yeah next this is one of my favorite topics in computer science it's distributed systems so uh, i've been talking about again server 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 i've been talking about servers and uber and ola these apps operate at such a huge scale that you can't run all of them at using just like one physical server you need many 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 servers uh, and this is what basically distributed systems are instead of having a single server uh, handling all of your load you distribute the load across multiple servers now this seems like a rather intuitive idea right if you i mean if a single person is, like if let's say we were lifting a car uh and if obviously a single person is unable is going to be unable to do that but if we have like 10 15 people lifting the same car it's going to be much easier right so it's this is kind of an intuitive idea you're distributing the load but uh it's easier said than done this is uh, this fee, this sub field has one of the most interesting uh has some of the most interesting problems you know engineering problems uh that you can face so uh and by the way you may uh, someone might say that okay then why don't you just build some more powerful servers that way you can have just one really powerful server instead of having like 10 not so powerful servers uh the problem is that there is a physical limit to how powerful we can make our computers and even if we like uh, there are huge huge computers like there are mainframes from IBM and Oracle but even they are severely underpowered even they cannot serve the entire load of uber and ola and uh, another scary thing about them is what if that one server just fails you have your entire service will go down so distributed systems are extremely important and these are uh, extremely common across uh, you know these uh, use services like uber ola google uh, netflix facebook pretty much any huge site they are running a distributed system behind the scenes so uh let's talk about some of the challenges if you are if you decide to become a distributed systems engineer uh these are the challenges that you'll face while building distributed systems and these are really interesting in my opinion so scalability so i said that you know uh, let's say one, you have one server and uh, it can do a thousand things at a time now if you have two servers does that mean you'll be able to does that mean your system will be able to do 2000 things at the same time that's not the case just because just because you add more servers doesn't mean you get you know that times the performance so if you have two servers doesn't you it doesn't mean you'll get two times the performance because uh, now these servers need to communicate with one another they need to coordinate whatever they are doing so that takes up a lot of overhead that takes up a lot of uh, time and you know yeah it, it's basically you won't if you have two servers you'll probably get like 1.5 to 2 times uh, 1.5 1.6 1. 1. 1.7 times the performance or something like that so your job as a distributed systems engineer would be to you know try to get the maximum possible uh, performance uh, if you add more servers so if you i i hope that makes sense does it does it make sense <laughs> does it make sense okay uh yeah okay i think a few people are responding cool now uh just because you have you had one server before now you're really rich your startup is huge you're getting all kinds of funding does this mean you add 10 servers and be done with it no if you make uh, if you jump from one server to 10 servers it's not automatically going to work you need to evenly distribute the load so that not uh, or uh, you know something like uh, what would happen is if you don't do this properly only a couple of your servers will get a large amount of load and the rest will just sit down you know sort of like doing uh, projects or something uh, you know in school just a few people are working really hard and the rest are just having the time of their life so you don't want that you want to distribute the load effectively evenly uh, synchronization among servers this is what i talked about before that all of your servers should be kind of in sync now this idea is kind of hard to explain without getting technical so i won't uh, I'll, i'll just stop here your servers should be able to you know they uh, 
they they shouldn't have any disagreements and they should be able to coordinate with amongst themselves and the last point is is really really interesting so failure handling uh let's say as i said you have 10 servers now you should design your system in such a way that even if a couple of servers from that from those 10 servers fail your system should still be operational and that's kind and that's kind of a mind blowing idea if you ask me that you have 10 servers a couple of them just fail they just crash or something and your system still works because the remaining eight will take up the additional load they'll share the load of the, of the servers that crashed so this is something that you should incorporate into the design of your distributed system and yeah th- this is one of the very interesting fields of computer science so let's let's move on does anyone have any questions uh, rohit we do have two questions in the chat from uh... you are a previous question break uh, okay. if you just scroll up a bit uh, in chat i think yajat says hey i have a doubt and then snehal also has a question okay i'll um, answer snehal's question first and i'll do, then go to yajat uh, are these data centers safe and oh, oh you safe okay safe enough uh yes yes uh it's actually yeah you kind of have to trust these companies uh with your data but the general idea is that it's safe because even the us military and the cia and i think the department of defense and all of them even they run their software on these platforms so they have billions and billion dollar d- deals so i think it's secure enough if governments and militaries can trust them we can definitely trust them uh, and you know if they start snooping in your data that's not good for their business this is a huge business for them and i don't think they would do these kind of things so uh does that answer your question snail snail right oh uh, yeah uh, what if our data gets mined uh what if your data gets mined can you repeat please uh means uh, i heard about the data mining so oh no no, no. data mining is a completely different thing and I, we, i will be talking about data mining is, is this you rajat uh no i am kaustu okay okay yeah just you'll have to type in your question uh kaustu uh i will be talking about data mining and it's a completely different thing i'll be talking about it in the further slides okay yeah just can you type in your question mm okay i'll just take your question the next time okay uh, just leave it there for me uh, oh he's asking can you hear me uh, no we cannot hear you actually so you'll have to type it in oh yeah but uh, i think if this is going to take a while okay vaishnavi has a question until then okay for some servers to work even if others don't work so what additional features do we need to add well uh, you know there needs to be some sort of coordination between your servers your sir uh, the rest of your you know each server should be able to detect if the other one has failed and if it has failed it should be able to take up its load so uh, it's kind of a uh, there are techniques to do this it's uh, it's a lot it's beyond the scope of this session unfortunately uh, it's i i'm afraid i don't have a straight forward answer to you know what additional features do we need to add we can talk about this offline does the gibberish and the original destination have a relation or the code is random characters uh it's random it's random it has nothing to do with destination okay that destination thing was just an example um you can encrypt anything you can encrypt your name or or your own whatever your password it could be anything there's no relation between the data and the gibberish does it ever happen that all the servers are not working well uh, that that would be disastrous <laughs> and uh, distributed systems engineers have to uh, arnav this is arnav's question uh it's uh, that would be disastrous that usually doesn't happen and if that happens you're in a bad place you need to take care of that and people do take care of take care about that uh how these servers are communicated they are typically they typically uh, communicate over networks seaways satellites yeah whatever they use hashing techniques for encryption oh well, uh, hashing is different from encryption but okay deepa is unable to see the slides can you join in from a different device okay i think i'm going to move on uh, i'll take the remaining questions later 
So did I miss any slides in between? Uh, no, I think uh, if there's no. just a connection issue, we can like just continue. Okay. So. I'm wrote. Uh, uh huh. There's one question in the chat, like right now. Okay. How does the server understand what gibberish means? Oh, um, okay. There's 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 some uh, intense mathematics going on behind the scenes in order to make that happen. Um, again, it, it, I would have to get really technical about it. There's like there are keys involved. The server and the the app would have the same key, and hence they are able to de encrypt and decrypt with the same key, and you know, hence, uh, hence it can make sense of the gibberish. Does that answer your question? It's a bit more technical than that. How many people can use one server at a time? Uh, it depends on the server. A server can uh, serve. A typical server would be able to serve like thousands and thousands of requests every minute or every second. Uh, yeah, every minute. They're pretty powerful. These these servers. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, guys. I'll have to proceed. Uh, we'll try to answer your questions uh, in the next Q and A break or at the qu question and answers in the end. So let's talk about backend development. Uh, is everyone mute? Just hold on. I'm hearing someone's. Uh, okay, cool. So let's talk about backend backend development. So uh, in the very first slide, I talked about how the server needs to perform a lot of tasks like you know finding a driver for you, finding a vehicle for finding a taxi for you, calculating your fare, and planning the most efficient route. And uh, well, all of those tasks need to be actually you know. Coded by somebody. These uh, things need to be implemented. Uh, the soft, the software for that, programs for that need to be written, and all of those programs will then run on the server. So, all of this comes under what we call backend development. This is because all of this stuff is happening behind the scenes. So it's called backend development, and you know this is basically this basically deals with all of the business logic, like. Uh, Handling user registration. So when you sign up, uh, it needs to you know verify your identity, save your name uh, and password and your details to the database, and um, payment handling and uh, backend development is a broad, broad topic. And this is another area with uh, uh, with a lot of which a lot of people start off with. So yeah, this is backend development is all of the software that runs on your servers. Uh, Let's move on. Uh, I see. I think there are a few questions in the chat, and uh, I will get back to those. So let's talk about some really, really hot topics in computer science, and this is getting really popular these days. This is rather really popular these days, and it's machine learning. And uh, this is something that Uber, you, uh, Uber, and Ola use behind the scenes. But before we get into how they use them, I, I want to talk about machine learning itself. Okay. And before we get into machine learning, I want to talk about how we as humans will learn. So, you know, when we are born, we, we don't really understand the environment, right? If you were to take a baby on the street and point to a car and ask the baby what that is, uh, I bet the baby won't be able to say car. The baby doesn't understand that it's a car. But as you grow up and as you, you know, see your environment, uh, you you see so many cars and so many different vehicles that you start learning, okay, this is a car, even that's a car, even though these cars might look different or, uh, you know, they, they may be different cars, they, you may look at them for, from a completely different angle or something, but we are able to recognize cars. We are able to recognize buses. We are able to tell cars and buses apart. So the point I'm trying to make is that as we see more and more things, uh, we sort of learn from all of these examples about, you know, um, let's say, how to recognize a car. This is not something that we are born with, but something that we learn from experience. We learn from examples. After looking at many, many examples, we are able to detect these little patterns in uh, in what we see and perceive. And that's kind of the same idea that machine learning uses. Because the reason, uh, uh, you know, machine learning and, uh, you know, we're talking about this is that you cannot actually write programs for everything. For example, if I ask you to write a program uh, and which you know looks at an image and tells whether or not that image contains a car, you can't write a program for it uh, in the traditional sense. Now, again, this is kind of hard to you know appreciate this uh, this idea, but you've got to trust me here. You cannot write a program to identify a program uh, to identify a car in a picture. The reason for that 
is because we cannot give a proper definition for what a car is i mean i can say you know a car has four doors it has an engine it has four wheels it has a window but what but each car has these things in a different way so you know an alto and a maruti alto will have will have a different door from a volkswagen polo or you know a, a tesla cyber truck looks completely different but yet as humans we we know that they're they're still a car because we kind of see the similarities in in the patterns and we are able to recognize those patterns and hence for tasks like these if we are if we were to you know make computers perform these tasks of like identifying uh, cars in a picture or you know recognizing someone's voice we need machine learning we can't just explicitly write a program for that so what we do is we uh, we sort of it's similar to the baby example that i just gave what you do is you provide the the program with lots and lots and lots of examples so let's say your uh, the car example uh, let's say you're writing a program which can tell whether or not a picture contains a car so what you would do is you would give the machine learning program lots and lots of examples of pictures of cars and you teach it to find patterns in these uh, in these images and once it has seen uh, a sufficient amount of examples and then you give it a new example it will look for those patterns and it will be able to identify and it will be able to say that mm mm-hmm, you know this looks like a car I, i have definitely seen these kinds of patterns before uh, i can say with like 80% confidence that this is a car and that's the basic idea behind machine learning instead of uh, you know explicitly telling uh, a program what how to you know reason about a uh, you know an image or something you provide it with lots and lots of lots of examples and it will learn through those examples it's similar to how people learn we learn through examples we learn through experience and that's the basic idea behind machine learning and i've been talking about an, uh, the example of a picture of a car but the same idea can be exa- uh, can be extended to other kinds of patterns so for example voice recognition or uh, you know a lot of phones these days are able to you know uh, recognize your face or uh, you know again making stock market predictions this is kind of interesting so based on how the stock market has you know behaved in the past you can feed all of that data to the machine learning program and based on that based on all of that experience it can make predictions about the future so it will be like okay uh, maybe based on the past uh, metrics this is what i think the stock this is how the stock market will behave so this is kind of the uh idea behind machine learning and this is an extremely hot f- field in computer science and that's the reason i'm kind of really emphasizing this this is what a lot of people are interested in the possibilities here are literally endless there's a lot of research going on and uh, this is just really really interesting so oh by the way i wanted to talk about this so this is uh this image is of a deep neural network this kind of this is a a program which uh mimics the behavior of the human brain so it's it's kind of interesting so how does uh, machine learning work at work for these taxi services like uber and ola so they use it for you know predicting what kind of demand they're going to be seeing so right now it's covid-19 uh, no one's using these services so that their demand is probably down but you know in regular situations they would be able to uh, look at past experiences and forecast what their demand is going to be like uh, dynamic price adjustment uh if you have used uber you know they have something called uh surge pricing so they i'm sorry they uh, change their prices depending on the current situation so again that they do using machine learning uh i'm just going to have some water okay just just give me a second okay so uh yeah scaling up and down as per demand so uh, we talked about cloud computing so if the demand is kind of low for taxis right now maybe uh these uh maybe uber can just reduce the number of servers they are using and save some money uh finding the best route they can uh you know uh look at the current traffic conditions and try to predict what kind how much time it will take for you uh to reach a destination and based on that they'll you know find the best possible route for you customer support we have so many complaints when we use uh, applications so uh, instead of you know employing people to sit down and talk to uh, you know customers you can have bots which can you know use or natural which can interact with people using natural language uh, calculating estimated time of arrivals this again kind of deals with you know the traffic and everything 
setting financial go- financial goals they can use past experience and uh, this is the most interesting part this i think is probably the pinnacle of what machine learning can do it's self driving cars so uber has their huge self driving car project and uh, they use computer vision so they have cameras and sensors on cars and they can identify objects in the in their environment and they can make decisions about how the car should go it's all really 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 interesting so uh, machine learning is hot it's a hot hot topic and a uh, related topic to machine learning uh, is data science so these days uh, we have uh, pretty much every app and service that you use collects a huge amount of data from you so uh, for example this uh, uber might be collecting data about how the driver the kind of speed the driver is driving at or uh, you know the the speed at which the driver uh, no uh, you know a lot of metrics they basically collect a lot of metrics if you're using other services like uh, let's say uh, i don't know youtube and uh, youtube might be making a note of where you're clicking which videos you're watching how long you're watching them are you skipping the ads they collect all of this data in order to make more sense of how you're using their service but just having all of this data just collecting all of this data and just having it sit there makes no sense it uh, so the point is that data by itself is useless even though you collect a lot of data it doesn't produce uh, it's i mean it won't produce value for you immediately it is val- it is of value only when you are able to make uh, you know extract some knowledge out of it extract some you know conclusions out of it and uh, the reason i'm talking so much about data science is because this is literally one of the hottest uh, jobs right now this is considered uh, a prestige this is considered to be a really prestigious jobs and people are getting paid really really good for this and it's a really interesting field so as a data scientist what you do is you take all of this data and you use statistics and machine learning and all of these uh, mathematical tools and you analyze this data you try to extract some meaningful uh, information from it you try to extract some knowledge from it okay so it, that it's not just some raw data it actually you know gives you something of value and usually this something of value is is tremendously useful for businesses because just think about this if google uh, if youtube is uh, able to understand what you like better in on their home page and what you are more likely to click on it means more business for them because they'll be able to feed you more ads and that's the reason companies love data scientists that's the reason uh, they're get, getting paid really really well and it's an extremely interesting uh feel so uber uh uses data science uber ola all of these apps use data science for like setting financial goals i uh, we talked about this dynamic pricing demand forecasting so based on the previous experiences previous data whatever they have collected they can uh they can you know change their app or their you know their algorithms their their software for the most profit that that's the basic idea so before we proceed let's uh, i'm going to take a few questions so uh i think dev had a question um okay. is captcha hard coded if you scroll up okay captcha hard coded uh no it's uh it's not hard coded i think it's generated on the fly i don't exactly understand what you mean by hard coded okay someone else is asking something is data science all about big data no uh big data is when you have basically a huge huge amount of information uh so just imagine google uh, i gave the example of youtube if youtube starts collecting a uh, data about you know where you're clicking on their website it's going to generate a huge amount of data because simply because a huge amount of people use youtube and in that case you would have to use these big data techniques where you have to like store a lot of data and uh, you know lo- uh, you you know efficiently sort of work with it what are the reasons of not making an app which considers both the prices of uber and ola taxis and then compare provide oh, blah, blah, blah. okay yeah that can definitely be done i don't see why that won't be possible uh, but uber and ola should let you do that <laughs> that's definitely a good idea though what are some things that machine learning hopes to achieve in the future but we aren't quite there yet right now uh, so yeah i talked about self driving cars uh, atharva has asked this question this is a good question uh it's an evolving field it's only become possible to you know do machine learning practically quite recently like i would say about a decade or so or maybe less than a decade ago 
and we are at a very very primitive stage right now of machine learning so i talked about self driving cars and uh, there are multiple levels to self driving cars so we uh, right now the kind of uh, you know self driving technology we have uh, you still need a driver on the seat even though the car is driving by itself you need someone just on the driver seat just in case someone goes wrong so we have to go a level above where you don't even need that driver so that's one of uh, that's one example and uh, uh, you know maybe you need uh, there are other things like natural language generation so it's when computers can are able to come up with natural language so maybe uh, something that sounds very human instead of uh, you know like maybe it one day you just tell a computer hey write uh, a resignation email for my boss and the computer will be able to come up with a really human sounding email uh, does normal android programming uh, advait okay let's just do this does normal android programming involve back end development by default because that involves writing code which is a behind the scene case uh, no the Okay, I I don't exactly understand what you mean. What what uh writing code which is a behind the scene case. What what does that exactly mean? I'll come back to your question. Please just just clear my doubt. Vedang is asking, but we can't say uh, that. Rohit, data... uh, uh-huh. just a second before you uh, proceed. Uh, there was another question that you might have skipped. Uh, Deepa. Oh, at the top. Uh huh. Uh, in data science, what does fingerprinting mean, and how is it used? Oh, I think uh. data science and fingerprinting i think it means that you're a uh, see these apps as i said are collecting a lot of information about you so uh, a fingerprint you know a real fingerprint means it's something that is unique to you so i think in data uh, what you're referring to is that in all of that data data that you know let's say uber collects if from that data they are able to identify you that like okay this piece of data is coming from uh, deepa then i think that means a fingerprint and that shouldn't happen most uh, you shouldn't typically be able to uh, you know map the data to its origin the origin being you so i think that's that's what you're referring to that to the best of my knowledge that's that's what you're that's what you're saying uh but we can't say that data is useless right because by that data it decides what ads uh, what ads should we see or such yeah but if you're just collecting all of that data and just storing it somewhere it's useless that way if you are actually you know running some uh, you know data science stuff on it so to speak uh, then it becomes useful so data by itself is useless but when you start you know extracting information analyzing it, it then it starts you know producing value then it's not useless does machine learning and data science have applications in other fields of science oh yeah yeah this these are really really general ideas machine learning and data science they are useful everywhere uh just to give you an example uh, i attended this conference recently and uh, the i think the engineer was from uh, i forget the name of the company i think he oh, yeah he was from mathworks uh, these are the people who make matlab and uh, he was talking about how they are using machine learning to uh, i think monitor or you know what <laughs> yeah it's a it's a huge uh, discussion in itself I, i that will take up way too much time how about you write about this to me uh, and i'll get back to you over email or maybe in the q and a session uh okay, can this is... data be leaked or uh, hacked uh-huh. uh huh uh, can you repeat that please can this data be leaked or hacked uh it depends on the company it can uh, they take a lot of precaution to uh, you know store it as securely as possible so see there's always a chance of something getting hacked uh but you what have to take the zoom? what what do you mean what about zoom as uh, recently its uh, data has been leaked uh... uh you know i um these kind of things keep happening and uh, these companies operate at such a huge scale that they have to take these measures they can't just be careless about data so yeah some of those companies i think zoom is a bit shady with their practices but uh, in general uh, they take the utmost uh, care to keep your data as safe as possible there can always be some vulnerability that that hackers come across and uh, exploit it so you need to be constantly on your toes when it comes to you know securing data you need to always employ the best possible practices so that uh, you're you know always 
mind uh, you know you're at peace your mind is at peace that your the data is secure okay these are a lot of questions okay manali what do you say i can probably save some of these for the q and a session if this is um, disturbing your flow okay. yeah uh, or if you want to talk talk to them now you can of course uh i think we'll we'll save this for the q and a okay these yeah, are we'll okay sure. cool guys is that okay with everyone's okay? asked questions <laughs> these are a lot of questions and uh, we can we can just, uh, it will really disturb the flow so let's just keep on going yeah. and we'll answer that uh, towards okay, the cool. end yeah all right so we are done with data science uh let's talk about databases a lot of people have been asking about you know how information is stored so our uh, databases are just a way to store all of this information now these uh at, you know on the face of it databases might seem like a really really simple idea they are storing data what what's so great about them uh this is actually a really really interesting topic because uh, if you think about it your data uh, you know all of the let's say your instagram and you're storing your data uh, or let's say your uber you're storing all of the user information in a database so that database should be secure it should be really really robust and uh, if you take up computer science this is one of the most interesting subjects that you'll ever come across it's it's really really interesting there's a lot to databases and unfortunately i won't be able to get into too much detail here but i'll talk about uh, basically the kinds of databases you see so there are two major kinds of databases one is relational another is non relational so relational databases are sort of like your excel sheets uh, i think everyone has used uh, excel here uh there's just tables and you have uh, let's say you're storing information about a person so you'll have columns like name age date of birth um i don't know gender stuff like that and in the rows you'll fill up the actual information about people so that's basically how relational databases are and uh, you can have multiple tables you can link them to each other they they are uh, <coughs> they are basically like excel sheets but they are far far more sophisticated and you have non relational databases which do not have this table like structure in fact they typically don't have any structure at all you are free to select the kind of structure you want so they can be a bit more flexible but uh, they are also not as efficient as relational databases so uber uses uh, mysql postgres sql react cassandra hadoop and redis and ola also uh, uses a, a pretty similar set of databases uh, these again on the face of it databases might not seem all that interesting but they do some really really uh, interesting stuff behind the scenes they do a lot of heavy lifting for you and uh, they're pretty incredible software products uh let's move on to programming languages so we've been talking about all of these things uh, and by the way uh oh no it's fine i i did cover that so let's talk about programming languages we've been talking about so many different things in uh, in computer science and all of these different ideas and the thing is you need to actually write some code uh to you know get these to working to bring these to life so all of that is obviously done using programming languages some of the popular ones i'm sure you people have at least heard the names java python c++ this weird thing this is not c hash this is c sharp javascript there are many 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 more programming languages i've just mentioned the really popular ones uh you can uh, you know this is what a lot of people start off with i started off by learning java this is how i got into computer science and uh, yeah learning languages is really really interesting uh now you can obviously uh, and when you get into computer science you will be learning at least a few programming languages uh and uh, you can either do that you can you'll obviously have to learn but you can also get into actually making programming languages themselves so there are people obviously someone has to make these languages right you can't just like they don't just grow on trees or fall out of the sky so people design languages they uh they design them so that it's easier for you as a developer as a programmer to write code uh, they make sure that your code runs as fast as possible on your machine and uh this last point maintainable this is actually something really interesting when you're when you're working on huge software projects you want to write uh, you know people typically want to write like really smart code and really uh, you know code which is not immediately uh, you know clear what what you're trying to do there are many people write code like this which is like really smart really efficient but you don't really understand what it's doing so what you want to do is write maintainable code and uh, this is another thing that uh, 
programming language implementers or you know the people who design programming language try to do they try to make sure that their language you produces you know maintainable code and one last thing that i i would love to mention is that uh, you know all of these programming languages java python c++ uh, we have so many of them but uh, and the, obviously your processor is running all of these programs but in fact your cpu the, your processor doesn't understand any of these languages these languages java python okay someone has the uh, yeah so your cpu doesn't understand any of that uh, the only thing it understands is a really f uh, fixed set of instructions that uh, are there so these are like really basic like add two numbers or subtract two numbers or move this stuff from here to here or something like that these so what we need to do is uh, programming language designers they need to come up with things called compilers and interpreters to actually translate this java python c++ javascript code into this into this instruction set and uh, in fact it's happening right now we are using microsoft teams uh, this thing i think is mostly written in a language called typescript and it is being uh, and there is an interpreter called v8 uh, which is translating all of that into your cpu's instruction set and that's kind of incredible right uh your cpu understands only one thing and one thing and that is its instruction set all of these languages all of these have to be translated somehow and uh, i think this is also a really really interesting field of computer science so uh we've covered a lot of ground here we've covered a lot of things of a, a lot of different subfields of computer science and there are definitely far more out there like bioinformatics uh and such but we haven't really talked about the very essence of computer science if you will you know these are all of these fields while they are really important they don't really talk about you know what computer science is really all about so i had promised you that we have memes and here are some memes so yeah all of these are all of these fields are all nice and good but uh, everyone gangsta until the real gangsta arrives and the real gangsta of computer science are data structures and algorithms and uh, i hope you like that i <laughs> i think that's pretty hilarious do you like that <laughs> okay only two people like that come on guys come on okay i'm going to move on so data structures and algorithms before we get into what data structures and algorithms are i want to briefly talk about what how a computer basically works okay this is really stupid but this is like the basic idea of what you know how a computer works you have some input you give it to the computer the computer performs some processing on it and it produces an output right input processing output now how does this actually work in your computer well uh, all of that input is stored in your ram these are uh, your ram and the cpu are like the fundamental resources in your computer everything i mean yeah you have all of these fancy graphic cards and you know multi core processors and you know ssds and what not but your cpu and ram your computer can literally cannot function without them and these are the uh, the absolute core stuff these are the fundamental resources within your computer so all of the input that i talked about in the previous slide it's stored in your ram and then your cpu performs some processing on that on that input and then uh, we sort of you know it performs some operations on that and then we get the output so okay this is what i was af afraid of so this slide is messed up hold on uh let me just i did try this in the afternoon and it was showing up as mess i'll just open up powerpoint and i'll show you the actual slide this is just sad uh, So guys this is the this is the actual slide so even though compute these cpu and uh, so yeah the basic idea is that these resources are limited cpu and ram are limited uh, i know today cpus are really really fast i think uh, is everyone able to see this yes uh, thumbs up thumbs down would be great cool okay 
So I'm going to jump back to the slide. OK, so even uh, though today's CPUs are really, really fast, you know, you have multi core CPUs, eight cores, uh, 12 cores, whatnot. And even though they're running at like three gigahertz, four gigahertz, uh, each of those operations that you perform on your input still needs some time. And it's obviously a good, it's always a good idea to have fewer number of operations so that, uh, you know, your program will execute faster. So fewer operations are always better. And uh, even though our computers have like several gigabytes of RAM these days, even uh, phones have eight and 12 gigs of RAM these days, it's still limited. It's not unlimited. So making the effi making efficient use of it is really, really important. Uh, so I'm going to jump back to this, the original presentation. Huh. Okay, can everyone see this? Thumbs up, thumbs down would be good. Just give me a minute, folks. I'm sorry about this. I should have uh, this. This is really annoying. I don't know why Microsoft Teams can't show something from Microsoft PowerPoint really well. <laughs> okay. So yeah. We want to make the best possible use of CPU and RAM. So here's where data structures and algorithms come in. So uh, data structures are basically a way of organizing your data in memory for, and you should be able to access that data really efficiently and modify it really quickly. So uh, if you want to make good use of RAM, you should use the best possible, most appropriate, most efficient data structure for your data. So some of the common data structures are, you know, an array. An array is just a list, just a list of, uh, you know, in this case, it's a number. It's, it could be a list of names of people. Uh, another really common data structure is a tree. Uh, if you think about it, you know, you have files on your computer, files and folders. So let's say you have a folder at the top and that folder contains a lot of files. So those are sort of, uh, it's it's sort of a tree structure if you think about it. Your folder will have some files uh, and more folders within it. Those folders will have more files and folders. So it, it's kind of forming a tree structure. So uh, your files are actually stored as a tree on your on your disk. Hash tables are uh, one of my favorite data structures out there. Um, you know, they store key value pairs. So an apple is red, watermelon is green, a banana is yellow. Uh, this is This is a hash table. So data structures are really, really important. The way you organize your data in memory is, uh, can you know, it can make a huge difference. Uh, and algorithms are how you perform a certain task. These, I cannot emphasize this enough. Algorithms can make or break your program. Literally, they're that important. So an algorithm, if you've never heard this word, it's just a sequence of tasks that need to be performed, a sequence of steps, uh, if you will, that need to be performed in order to accomplish a task. So for example, uh, if you want to make tea, uh, you know, the first task would be to grab a vessel, pour some uh, water in it, add uh, tea leaves, yeah, and obviously keep it on heat, uh, add sugar, uh, let it boil, and then serve it. So it's an algorithm to that, that's an algorithm. That's how you make tea, that's the task. So in computer science, uh, you know, an efficient algorithm would have as little tasks as possible so that, you know, uh, you can accomplish uh, as little steps as possible so that you can accomplish your task faster. So some examples of algorithms would be, you know, searching uh, for an for an element in an array. So let's say this is uh, this we have this array, and we want to search if uh, the number twelve exists in this array, and it doesn't. So searching and and sorting, you can even sort this array. Searching and sorting are some of the most fundamental algorithms. Uh, finding the height of a tree. So uh, the height of the tree is sort of the la longest, this path that you can follow along the tree. Uh, find the shortest path between two locations on a map. This is what we've been talking about throughout this session. Uh, if you, uh, if, you know, for Uber and Ola, if you have two destinations, uh, if you have two points on a map, you know, your location and your destination, you want to find the best possible, shortest, most efficient path. You, well, you need algorithms for that. You need efficient algorithms for that. Uh, finding relevant websites based on a search query. You open up Google, you type in a query, and Google literally scans the entire internet and hands you your results. So they're obviously using some really, really efficient and smart algorithms behind the scenes uh, in order to serve you your results so quickly. So 
again, I'm going to say this one more time, data structures and algorithms are really, really important. They are at the very heart of computer science. They are the essence of computer science. And just to drive the point home uh, further, just to, you know, sort of hammer it into your head how important they are, I'm going to show you an example. Uh, I think everyone here knows what a GCD is, greatest common divisor. I think everyone has learned this in school. Uh, we've, now I'm going to compare two algorithms for calculating GCDs of extremely huge numbers. And when I say extremely huge, I mean like 100 digit, 500 digit, 1000 digit numbers. Numbers this huge. And uh, we want to do that uh, as fast as possible. So I'm going to compare two algorithms, an inefficient algorithm and an efficient algorithm. Now, before I get into this, you might ask Rohit, well, why the hell would I ever need to calculate GCD of such huge numbers? Well, we talked about cybersecurity and uh, how, um, you know, uh, we have these encryption and decryption algorithms. Well, it turns out that one of these algorithms is called RSA and it really, de and it depends on the fact that we can calculate GCD. It requires us to calculate GCDs of extremely huge numbers. So we need, uh, we need to calculate GCDs in order to, uh, you know, do online payments or, you know, talk to your friends securely on WhatsApp or, you know, have this uh, encrypted video call right now. Calculation of GCDs is important. And uh, I've put up this code just so you have something to look at just, uh, but I won't be getting into the code, don't worry. So let's just compare these algorithms. Uh, this inefficient one, even for 20 digit numbers, now 20 digit is rather small. I said uh, we need an algorithm for like 100 or 500, 1000 digit numbers. Even for just 20 digit numbers, this, this algorithm will take thousands of years. Do you have a thousand years to wait for your payment to process or, uh, you know, your message to reach your friend? This would be nice. Thumbs up, thumbs down would be nice, guys. Do you have thousand years? Are there any of you magical creatures? Uh, I don't think so, right? No one has that kind of time. This is extremely inefficient and we can definitely do better. So the efficient algorithm, in contrast, it takes just a blink of an eye to find the GCD of 500 or even 1000 digit numbers. Just, just look at the difference. It's staggering, right? This is the difference between you being able to send a message securely to your friend and not. So, yeah, algorithms are really, really important. This difference is just huge. And uh, you need to be really smart when you're designing algorithms. So I'm going to see this one last time. Data structures and algorithms are at the very heart of computer science. They are the essence of computer science. And uh, that's that's pretty much it. But before I go, uh, I want to show you some, I want to share some tips if you're going to take up a career in computer science. This is one of the most hyped up fields out there. You know, there's a lot of hype surrounding computer science. And I don't want you to get lost in the hype when you take this up. You know, don't just follow the hype. Don't just uh, be like, okay, machine learning is really hot right now. So I'm only going to focus on machine learning. That's not how it works. You need to understand the basics. Dabble with everything uh, in this field and find your niche, find your real interest. Don't just go with whatever is popular. Another thing is don't just learn technologies, learn the principles behind them. So, you know, Android development is good. It's a technology. It allows you to write apps really simply. But try to think of how uh, those apps actually you know how the uh, the app is actually displayed on screen there is uh, there's so much within android that is making uh, all of that possible you know this is kind of hard to explain without getting technical but a lot of people just follow the use these fancy tools and technologies and try to build products uh, and that's just sad go try to understand the basics the fin the principles the fundamentals and you'll have a great time as a computer engineer don't chase the next shiny thing. Well, this is all, uh, you know, people keep saying that computer science is a rapidly evolving field. And, uh, you know, every every day there's something new. And that's true to a certain extent, but also kind of false. Because if you understand the basics of something, learning these, you know, these changes every day is not going to be hard because it doesn't evolve that fast. People just keep doing things in a slightly different way. And, uh, they make a big deal out of it. But if you know the basics, you won't be intimidated by these new things. And this this point, this is pretty much one of the, uh, the core reasons why I even wanted to conduct this session. 
CS, computer science, is not just programming. Yes, programming is a major part of it, but it, CS by itself is not programming. You know, this would be like saying, uh, CS is programming would be like saying that maths is about writing equations. Is it? It's not, right? It's definitely not. It's it's just a means to an end. It's just a way to express your ideas. What matters are your ideas. So computer science is not just programming. It is logical and analytical thinking. You're presented with a problem and you should be able to you know reason about it, think about it logically and analyze it, analyze various solutions to it. It's problem solving. It's uh, it's showing your creativity through problem solving. And that's that's really the core of computer science. And you might think that, you know, Hakaitri was, but he, you know, I'm just saying some nonsense here. But uh, as you sort of mature through this field, this is what you'll slowly realize. And uh, if you start off with this mindset from the very beginning, it will really, really help you. I promise you this will help you because a lot of people just get lost in these first three points. You know, they just, you know, they uh, go for the hype or they, uh, they just learn some technology and don't focus on the basics. But if you are good at problem solving and, you know, thinking analytically and logically, if you're creative, uh, computer science is the field for you. And all of these things, if you do these, this is basically what separates mediocre engineers from the really brilliant ones. You So, you know, these big companies like Microsoft and uh, Google, they're notorious for their tough interviews. And these tough interviews don't deal with, you know, whether or not you can use some fancy tool or technology or, you know, you can learn, program in this a uh, new programming language. No, they focus on the basics. They focus on these things. The fourth point that I mentioned here, logical thinking, analytical thinking, problem solving, and creativity. That's what they always try to find out, uh, you know, in their interviews. I've been through Microsoft's interview process and I'm telling you, uh, this is it. This is, this is the stuff that separates mediocre engineers from the really brilliant ones. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So thank you. I, I hope you enjoyed this session.